everybody. Um, welcome to our meeting today. Uh, I'm protecting North Slope communities from the expansion of offshore development. Uh, Kristen Miller with Alaska Wilderness League. Um, and we just want to start by thanking Betty McCollum's office for giving us this room and for helping promote this briefing today. And um, thanks to the other organizations, Earth Justice, Audubon, um, WWF, Oceana, and uh, NRDC for sponsoring it with us. Um, we have a great presentation and a great panel. Uh, we're just going to start off with a PowerPoint done by Pete Van Tyne, who's right here. Uh, he's uh, an attorney from Anchorage, and he's been working on Arctic oil and gas issues for 20 years and indigenous issues, and he represents the conservation community and the native community on a lot of these issues. Um, and then we also have a panel of native leaders that will speak after um, Pete is done with his PowerPoint, but I want to just introduce quickly very happy that they're here. They travel a long way to come and speak to you guys today, and they've been doing a lot of work this week. So we're so thankful they're here, and um, they're going to talk to you about how the decisions and the information that Pete's going to talk to you about affects them, already is affecting them, and future decisions will affect them and the communities where they live and the people that they represent. So um, the first of our uh, tribal leader, women leaders is Carolyn Cannon. Um, and <laughs> Uh, she is the president of the um, Native Village Point Hope, which is way over here, so from very, very far away. Um, Native, uh, I'm sorry, Point Hope is a traditional Nubian whaling community with 900 tribal members. As you can see, it's on the shore of the Chukchi Sea. Uh, and Caroline, along with a lot of tribal members, wears many hats. So she is also the, she serves on the board of the Manila Association. She is on the board of the Arctic Slope Native Association and of the Alaska Tribal Health Consortium. Uh, our next tribal speaker will be Rosemary Akonarak, who also wears many, many hats. Um, she currently lives in Barrow and has lived on the Arctic Ocean her entire life. She, um, before she moved to Barrow, she lived in New Exit, um, and in New Exit she served as a mayor for many years, and she was also a uh, council member, a tribal council member, a school advisory council member, a subsistence advisory board member, and a longtime community health aide. Um, and she served on um, the Inupiat community of the Arctic Slope, which is the Alaska Native Regional Tribal Government for the North Slope. Um, she has served as a council member for the Alaska Intertribal Council, and she is a founding member of the nonprofit organization Resisting Environmental Destruction on Indigenous Lands, which you'll hear more commonly known as Red Oil. Um, and our third tribal leader is Doreen Lamb, and she's the president of the Inubiat community of the Arctic Slope, which again is the federally recognized tribal government that governs um, all the tribal members on the North Slope. Uh, she represents over 9,000 tribal members across eight villages um, in the entirety of the North Slope. So we're so happy that they're here, and I'll let them start talking. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you all for being here. I hope the microphone isn't too loud, but we're uh, taping this. And these folks have come a long way. It took Caroline two days to get here uh, from Point Hope uh, because weather conditions and just sheer distance. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a long way away politically and it's a long way away physically. And I think you'll, you'll get a sense of that from our talk today. This part of America is home to some uh, really amazing and iconic species. Go ahead, Brian, and flip a couple. Um, you know, we've got whales, bowhead whales. Uh, there are uh, walrus and beluga whales, this is a ring seal, eiders, um, really remarkable species. This is a beluga whale, some of you might recognize. And they're going through a lot of stress for reasons completely unrelated to oil and gas. And I'd like to reference the walrus. This is a picture taken in late August. And it's of a, a really unique occurrence of, uh, this is about uh, 8,000 walrus. Right now, or a little bit later in August, it turned into 20,000 walrus came on shore at a time of year when they typically are on the ice. A walrus are an ice-dependent species. Each mother uh, has about 100 pounds of food a day that it needs uh, to survive and, and to have enough nutrition to pass on to their, their babies. And when they do not have the ice sheet on which to travel, which automatically moves them over the outer continental shelf, allowing them to dive to the ocean floor to get that kind of food, they come on these aggregations on shore. This is new. We've just seen it in the last few years. And they'll have to travel as much as 40 miles from this spot to get food and bring it back for their babies. 
Um, you know, think about the, the stress that that puts on the species. We don't really know what that is, what that stress is, but we know it's significantly different than what they have done through history to this point. So that's just one example of the changes. And you'll hear from some of the others about um, what some of those other values are. You can leave it there for a moment. What, what I'm going to talk about is the basic regulatory structure for decision making about oil and gas activities in this environment. I'm going to give you a snapshot of where we are today, and I'm going to explain what the experts say about the state of science, about the state of information, things like the walrus and the polar bear in the, Ar <coughs> pardon me, in the Arctic, and the ability that we have today to deal with impacts from oil and gas activities in the Arctic. Uh, and I'm also going to give you an opinion on what we, what, what we uh, are, what we should be doing in the Arctic. Okay, go ahead, Brian to this next one. So here's the Outer Continental Shelf regulatory structure. And this is the main law that deals with the outer, uh, with oil and gas drilling on the Outer Continental Shelf. The Outer Continental Shelf is from three to 200 miles offshore uh, in Alaska. It's actually relatively shallow waters, close to the three miles, and it gets deeper the farther you go out. There are four stage process. The first stage is what's called the five year plan. And this is really the big picture thinking. There are 26 planning areas off of the United States that we call our Outer Continental Shelf planning areas. And what this stage of the process does is decides which of those 26 planning areas is going to have lease sales that are available for leasing in a particular five-year window. So at its, at its core, well, there's a lot of analysis and, and uh, uh, justification that goes behind it, but at its core, it's simply a sheet of paper with a five-year schedule of lease sales. And uh, that's for right now, we're in the 2007 to 2012 five-year window, if you will. Uh, the second stage is when those particular lease sales on that sheet of paper actually get scheduled and held. And so both of those stages are controlled by the U.S. Department of Interior. The third stage occurs when an oil company that has bid on and successfully been awarded one of those leases says, okay, I now want to explore my lease track. And so I have a right to file an application for exploration, and that consideration of that application is stage three. And then finally, stage four is that same company coming back and saying, yeehaw, I found oil, and I found it in commercial quantities, and I'd like you to give me permission to develop and produce that oil. Okay, so that's the main authorities. There are parallel authorities that go along with that, and these are some of the primary ones. Common sense on the first one, folks, if you're going to have oil and oh, maybe common sense after Deepwater Horizon, anyway, which is that if you're going to have these kind of uh, exploration development activities, you need a, a plan to prevent and respond to oil spills. So that's uh, one of them, Clean Air Act. These are uh, very, very air pollution intensive activities that occur. It's essentially armadas of ships with drill rigs, big, big engines. And they, they can put out quite a lot of air pollution, so the Clean Air Act permits are critical. Clean Water Act permits, uh, most of the time they actually discharge their pollutants right off the deck of the, of the uh, drill rig, and so regulating that is important to protect the environment. Marine mammals in that area, as you saw some pictures of many of them, uh, sensitivity to that is an important thing. And what we used to have, but do not anymore, is a coastal management plan in Alaska. This is under the Coastal Zone Management Act, a federal law that encourages state coastal management plans. And it encourages it by throwing a bunch of money at the state, getting the local districts to build plans that say, hey, here's what we think development should look like in our area, and here are the conditions under which we think it should occur. And in its finite wisdom, I'm sorry to say, our current state government has decided that that's too much local control for them to handle, so they kick the system, they kick the plan. So now I'm going to talk about uh, what the state of the Arctic is right now. So Brian, if you can bring it up. This is a map that's also on the hard board over here, and it shows existing or uh, leasing history in the north uh, slope. In the Beaufort Sea, here we have it in the Chukchi Sea over there. I mentioned that, that uh, five-year leasing program. In 2007, President Bush approved a drilling program that had an absolutely massive expansion of that oil and gas leasing schedule in the Arctic. It went from what had been before that 9.6 million acres, which was in an area here. This is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and this is the National Petroleum Reserve. These are state lands. This is where the activity uh, that occurs on land uh, is right now. It's an area 
roughly the size of Rhode Island. Uh, it's big enough you can see it from space with the lighting that goes on there and the flaring and, and other activity. And because it's close to infrastructure, this part of the ocean has been offered for offshore oil and gas leasing through the Clinton administration, through the Bush administration, well, the beginning of the Bush administration. But in 2007, Bush expanded the Beaufort to this whole area that you see here, 33.3 million acres, and there had been no leasing in the Chukchi in the prior uh, two or three five-year leasing programs, and that's 40 million acres you see in the pale pink on the left. Um, at just at the end of the Bush administration, they pushed through one lease sale in the uh, Chuck C, and that was called Lease Sale 193. I say that uh, as a lawyer because that lease sale was actually pushed through um, in a, a, what, an arguably improper manner, and in fact has since been held illegal by a court. Um, and uh, it nevertheless resulted in Shell Oil, ConocoPhillips, and Stad Oil uh, bidding on uh, about 10% of the lease sale area. Shell got uh, $2.1 billion in, in leases that it put in. It really wanted the Chukchi. Um, and ConocoPhillips and Stad Oil got uh, leases as well. Um, the 2007 five-year leasing program, Caroline Cannon challenged that in court along with the Alaska Wilderness League with the native village of Point Hope. Um, as well as uh, another group called Pacific Environment. And the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, not the liberal bastion of the federal court bench, uh, ruled it illegal and actually ultimately vacated it. Uh, Secretary Salazar, uh, in reconsidering that leasing program, said, we're not going to hold any more lease sales in the Beaufort and Chukchi in that five-year window. We're just not going to do it. But so far, he hasn't uh, revisited sale 193. In a separate case in the federal district court in Alaska, also not a liberal bastion of judiciary, federal, a Fairbanks judge sat on that case, was also kicked back to Secretary Salazar. He's going to be making his decision by October 3rd on that. Um, finally, there's been exploration plans that Shell has done in the Beaufort from some of its pre-2007 leases. And as a result of court cases, those have not gone forward either. They tried just before the Deepwater Horizon, and Secretary Salazar said, mm, we're going to take some time, look at the Deepwater Horizon impacts before we decide whether you can go ahead with that. More, very recently, he just approved at the beginning of August an exploration plan for Shell in the Beaufort. So that's kind of the status of where we are now. And I'm going to talk about the two main issues that are real problems with Arctic drilling and some of the, the challenges that, that, that we face in making these decisions. The first one is lack of science, lack of information. You saw the dynamic changes going on with the walrus in that previous slide. That's not the only species. Whales, bowhead whales that are so important, not just for themselves, but for the subsistence uh, purposes for the indigenous communities that have lived there for so long. We don't know enough about their yearly habits to know the areas that are most important to protect or the areas where they can withstand some anthropogenic impacts. We just don't know that. That's what the United States Geological Survey says. Uh, and they released a report on June 23rd this year. Secretary Salazar asked them to do this report. And he said when he asked them to do it, we need to make responsible decisions. We need to understand the environmental and social consequences of development and plan accordingly. This USGS report will help inform determinations about what we need to know to develop our Arctic energy resources in the right places and in the right way. So everyone's been looking to this USGS report to help inform these decisions. So that's one sub-agency within Interior. Secretary Salazar sits at the top of Interior. Another sub-agency within Interior, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulatory Reform. Who thinks of those? Uh, regulatory enforcement of those uh, names. The acronym is BOMR, BOMRI, BOMR, uh, soon to be BOM. Uh, they're changing things around a little bit there. It's anyway, the agency formerly known as MMS. Um, that agency has decided that none of that information that's missing, and there was quite a long list of it, is essential to their choice in, on whether oil and gas activity should occur. So they've uh, at least recommended to the secretary that he go ahead with sale 193 the way it was, and uh, also approve that Beaufort exploration plan. It's great tension between these two sub-agencies. And that tension in, in the executive br branch gets uh, directed upward. Secretary Salazar is on that hot seat right now. And we think that he should cancel sale 193. It was rotten from the beginning. 
And he's also considering a, the 2012 to 2017 leasing program. And we think that until he addresses these information gaps and some of this fill response stuff I'm going to talk about in a moment, that he should keep those areas off <coughs> limits on that lease sale sheet to go to the So um, go ahead to the next one. Too. These are, again, just some of the species. And go ahead. So oil spills. Uh, Offshore drilling in the Arctic presents challenges to oil spills unlike anywhere else in the United States. I don't think that is shocking to many of you. Uh, you know, this is an environment that uh, for much of the year uh, is very dark, very cold, and ice infested, solid ice or broken ice environment. Um, there's uh, high winds, there's uh, 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 no, there is no harbor for big ships in the Arctic on this entire coast. It's shallow water. There's an Endicott Causeway, which is where that, on the previous, uh, where, the, where I showed the state facilities, there's one harbor, not big ships, and it gets silted in quite a bit. They're constantly digging it out or trying to. I've experienced that a number of times firsthand. And where is the nearest Coast Guard station? Go ahead and pop through these. The nearest Coast Guard, um, this, isn't, this isn't a cartoon, this is... Google Earth, this is great. Uh, the nearest Coast Guard station is over a thousand miles away. This is Kodiak, that's Barrow. Deepwater Horizon, who, who was responsible for responding to that? Who would be responsible for responding to an oil spill, oil spill in the Arctic? The Coast Guard, and they're nowhere near the place. Um, the most recent oil spill in the Beaufort Sea uh, was described as a failure. And we're, we'll skip that, right, it'll be fine. But, this was in 2005, and the people that did it said, this is just a failure. It's just not working. The booms get knocked out of the way by the ice pans that are there. You can show just a picture of the ice pans. You know, this try and clean up oil in that with, with ships that have booms on them. It's just not going to work. And that's a calm, sunny day. You can see where the oil is. How Shell says, in their Exxon Valdez, we cleaned up 8% of the oil. In the deep water horizon, 5% of the oil. But we're really good, Shell says. We're not like those other guys. We're going to clean up 95% of any oil that we spill into the water. Not that we're going to spill any, because we're really good. But if we do, we're going to clean up 95% of it. It's just unreal that they make these assertions in this day and age. And it, it's just wrong. Um, it just can't happen. Do you want to know what happens if they can't clean up the spill in that time frame? And they have to leave it uh, in, they, they call it their leave-in plan place. And they're going to leave that, that oil uh, in the ice, and they'll say, we'll come back later in the spring and get it. So that they think that somehow it's like a pool, perhaps, that it's going to remain constant, and they're going to be able to come back and get it. Hopefully, they will have stopped the gusher by that point, but if not, we'll deal with it in the spring. Other oil companies have looked at, how do you find the oil later on when it's been uh, dispersed by currents and ice and storms? And uh, other, this is the, just a picture of the Deepwater Horizon. But this is no joke. They studied, this is a dachshund. And this dachshund has been trained to find oil under ice. So they would bring this dachshund and some other dogs to the Arctic, put them in insulated dog carriers, because they get cold. Uh, cold. Oh, this one has long hair. We were glad to see that. But I, you know, I have a report that goes through this, and this is sort of where we are. And, and I bring it because it's kind of humorous in that kind of sick kind of way, to me anyway. Um, but uh, it's also illustrative of what we haven't done, which is that understood what our oil spill response is in relation to our ability to get oil out of the ground. We can, as, as the Coast Guard has said, as, as senators and congressmen have said, we have the ability to get oil from increasingly remote and hard places, but our ability to respond to oil spills in those places has, has not uh, kept up with the pace of that technology to develop it, and that needs to change. So thank you, Kristen, and I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't know if I need the mic or not. My name is Caroline Cannon. Again, my name is Caroline Cannon, and my Inupiaq family name is Kukawak. I live in Point Hope, Alaska. I am the president of Native Village of Point Hope, a federal recognized tribal government. We have we have dedicated to protect the interests and the tradition and the way of our life of our tribal members. 
Point Hope is known to be the oldest continuous inhabited village of the North America. Their population is 500, excuse me, 900. We've been able to live here because of the rich marine environment, which provides the food for our people. We hunt and subsist on bowhead whales, belugas, seals, polar bear, fish, caribou, ducks, and geese. And when we are fortunate, because of that climate change, we've been blessed the last 10 years with salmon berries and blueberries to add on to our diet. It is essential, therefore, that our land and water are clean for the animals and the plants. The culture, the cultural and the subsistence tradition of Pointo are linked to the health of the Arctic ecosystem and the resource of our traditional lands and waters. I've been a subsistence user all my life. I participate in the hunting of the whale, the ahmed. My parents are both known to be, have been successful wedding captains, as were my grandparents. I am currently the assistant to my sister-in-law's wedding crew, while my brother is the wedding captain. And I'm proud to say that. Preparation for the whaling is a year-long process. We normally start preparing in March for the hunting, sewing the skins, preparing the tools, cleaning out the underground freezers, which we refer as sevelops, that were built generations ago, our hunt in the spring. And in June, we share and celebrate the three days of the landing of the whale. We hunt Ugrooks. The bearded seal, right after wedding feast, we hunt for the skins and the food. It takes six skins to cover our wedding boat. We continue to practice that traditional way of life. And when that's done, we prepare our food to last for the year. The Arctic Ocean is a home to the animals that we do not eat, but nevertheless respect. Our ocean is our garden. Our ocean is our garden. Our subsistence practice are not as an individual endeavor or even a family endeavor. The whole community is involved. This way of life is what I hope to pass on to my grandchildren, through them and to their children and so on. It's my responsibility to make sure that my children and my grandchildren can live this lifestyle. And scientifically, it's been proven that our people who eat native food are healthier. And our relationship to the ocean is not just food. It, it defines our way of life and is part of our identity. You can take that ocean away, but you can kill, but you can kill our culture. The fact that the United States has sold the oil lease and the traditional waters of our native village of Point Hope, the Chuck G. C., causes my community great alarm. The traditional knowledge indicate that the oil and gas activities threaten the existence of our traditional culture. We are already facing the consequences of climate change of the Beaufort Sea coast. This cumulative stress may prove it to be a tipping point. I know that the oil spill in the Buford and Chuck GC cannot be cleaned up. I am haunted by the wary that the spill will occur in the waters, in our waters. I envision what our home could be like if such a disaster occur. I've seen my brothers and my sisters in the southeast Alaska suffering from the impact of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. A damage can last a lifetime. I remember the pictures and imagine the same hundreds of thousands of people that work in the Prince William Sound invading our home, disturbing our culture and our community, and accomplish them. Our elders stood up and told us to be prepared to protect our way of life. I remember one particular 
said that money well ran out and all these projects. As long as we keep our way of life, Mother Nature will always take care of us and she has not failed us yet. But we must always respect Mother Nature and in return she respects us. We deserve to be respected and heard, not just as, as an individuals or as community members, but as a sovereign government to whom the United States owes a trust responsibility. We expect the United States to honor this tradition and work cooperatively with the communities in order to preserve our traditional way of life. The proposed oil and gas activities affect not simply our ability to feed ourselves and others in the community or the cultural tradition around our subsistence activities or such our employment or such our enjoyment of these activities but they affect the very foundation of who we are as individual and as people. We have a right to life, to physical to physical integrity, to secure, and the right to enjoy the benefit of our culture. For this, we will fight. Our culture can never be bought or repaired with money. It is priceless. Thank you. My name is Rosemary Adomaro. I've lived on the coast of the Arctic Ocean for most of my life. I recently moved to Barrow, Alaska from Noxit. This is Noxit. I moved to the village to be a health aide, but it didn't keep me there for that. I served as mayor on numerous councils and organizations related to tribal leadership. And for a long time as a community health aide, our villages don't have doctors. We talk to them over the phone. We send our patients away to Barrow for that. I'm here to tell you how oil and gas development affect those of us who live on the Arctic Slope. Legislation currently moving through Congress called the Jobs and Energy Permitting Act and the Clean Air Act permits currently being considered by the Environmental Protection Agency allow the oil industry to sidestep regulations on pollution as set forth by the Clean Air Act. We will have a devastating impact on my people who have called the Arctic home for thousands of years. Shell's proposed 2010 activities in the Chukchi Sea, most of which would be exempt under this law, would have released as much pollution as 825,000 cars driving 12,000 miles in a year. And next year, they're looking to more than double that. Emissions from ocean-going vessels that Shell proposes to use, including major contributions, contributors to global climate change. It's been well documented that air pollution travels long distances. And Shell's 2009 application for drilling permits showed that the operations in the Arctic's Chukchi Sea could cause significant health impacts to Arctic Slope communities. We're rightfully concerned about the ramifications of these emissions and the overall actions as proposed. Our people have markedly higher rates of pulmonary disease than the general U.S. population, and we may have a genetic predisposition to diseases different than other populations. Our people are substantially more vulnerable to the morbidity and mortality of air pollution than our other Americans. When I started my career as a health aide in 1986, there was only one asthmatic patient. When I took my first break in 97, there were 60 people who had to use medications to help them breathe. This increased to 75 in 2000. For this small village of more than 500 people, when it got to be over 600% increase in respiratory patients, shouldn't we get some kind of response? Yet our voices continue to be ignored. Watching the eyes of the babies fighting to breathe, it 
tears into you. Try to breathe through one of those straws the next time you take a coffee. See how long you last. Think of those people who have pollution emitted and trying to breathe around it. Families have to fly sick children out of the village to Barrow or Anchorage. Knowing that the family has to send a parent with the child, what does it take from the family and the community? Yet, the, despite the direct effects on our community, the Jobs and Energy Permitting Act, and currently Arctic Ocean Air Permits, would have a direct impact on our people. From my own personal experience, the claims from the Environmental Protection Agency and this legislation, there will be no harmful impacts from offshore drilling. This is not true. Moreover, the legislation would not allow the meaningful participation in the clean air process, while explicitly preserving the industry's right to appeal these same decisions. The current process is failing. For example, the federal government has continually failed in the responsibility to conduct government-to-government -government consultation with our people. Recently, EPA also held hearings for these air permits, which significantly limited public participation. The Arctic Ocean is our garden. For thousands of years, we have stood watch over this garden and the animals that live in it, and hope that risky oil and drilling isn't approved that would stop us from fulfilling our sacred duty to protect this place and pass it on to our future generations. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dorian Lampi. I'm the president of the Inupiat community of the Arctic Slope. It's a federally recognized tribe pursuant to the Indian Reorganization Act of 1936. We serve eight villages from Point Hope to Kaktovik to Barrow to Anaktovik Pass. We currently have about 9,000 members and we have opposed offshore drilling since MMS first came to meet with our communities in the 1970s. And there's just a few of us left that still oppose it. You guys might hear from our fellow Inupiaks that are in the ASRC Regional Corporation, which is empowered to pursue economic development. We have a resolution that we passed in 2009. It's calling for a moratorium on offshore oil and gas. We believe that the United States federal government is still prepared for response for oil spill in the Arctic. The Gulf of Mexico was a very close, very surrounded ocean type of a gulf that was easily accessible by Texas, Louisiana, and the other other oil company related responses that they're, they're much closer and were able to somehow respond, but we have a deep water horizon spill. They had no capability to stop that. They did not choose to let it run, but they chose to proceed with this development with an inadequate oil spill plan or recovery. The Arctic is very, very far. I attended a U.S. Coast Guard meeting telephonically while there was a blizzard in Barrow, and I told them, I would like to know the time response for you to come to the Arctic and respond to the most active lease sale in the Arctic, in the Chukchi or in the Beaufort. And I want to know your time response. Not just get up and go and see how fast you can get there, 
but what kind of equipment are you going to bring there? They had no idea. They had no clue. They've never tested themselves for that type of event. So, I'm very, very disappointed with the lease sales that have occurred in the past. We have had to file a lawsuit with Native Village of Point Hope as friend of the courts to our federally recognized tribe that is associated under our umbrella as a regional federally recognized tribal government. I'm just really, really sad about the state of Alaska and their inappropriate plans that are in place. The Exxon Valdez, that spill is still sitting at the bottom of the Prince William Sound. There is no follow-up. There is no plans to clean it up. There is nothing in place to secure the oil companies to be held accountable and responsible to clean up an oil spill. And over the last 17 years sitting in the Planning Commission meetings, all I hear is that our response to, to preventing and from having a very large oil spill is preventing a very large oil spill. And I'd like to thank the Obama administration for putting in place a means to have the oil companies put in place a very large oil spill. Although we oppose oil and gas development in the Arctic Ocean, we need to have the safety and development standards set up for the Arctic that are managed by ICAS, our regional tribal government. Currently, the North Slope Borough manages and regulates oil and gas onshore, and they rezone the conservation district to resource development district, and they go through the public areas and all the hoops through the North Slope Borough. But there is nothing like that in place in the Arctic Ocean offshore. There is nothing, but I guess we claim the land 200, the ocean 200 miles from our coast, and we want to be a part of the, have a seat at the table and have that in place. That, as the regional tribal government for the Arctic Slope, we oppose offshore oil and gas development in the Arctic. The poor fellow that survived that deep water horizon was saved by the grace of God to tell his story. And still, today's newspaper, they put the blame equally on all three contractors. And what they do in the Prince William Sound, Exxon Valdez, they were still pointing fingers. Whose fault is it? Whose jurisdiction is it? Whose oil is it? Is it Shell? Is it BP? Is it Conoco? Is it Exxon? Stad Oil? Brooks Range? Whose oil was it? Whose responsibility is it to clean that up? And still, Exxon waited and hid it behind the courts for over 20 years before they paid any plaintiffs any type of settlement. The federal government cannot let the oil companies hide behind the courts. You need to be prepared. You need to have structures in place. You need to have boom camps set up along where these villages are. And you need to have some type of a means to get there. In the winter, it's dark. We haven't heard what the comprehensive plan is for the Chukchi Sea when it turns dark 24 hours a day. What are they going to do? stay out there, they're going to leave for the winter. It's dangerous out there. North Slope Borough is the currently the only one with the North Slope Borough Search and Rescue Department stationed in Barrow. And we had to downgrade our Bell, nice big Bell helicopters to these really tiny little helicopters that has less gas and less travel distance. And if the Coast Guard can get there, they're going to depend on the North Slope Board to get there. But when, since we have downsized the government, the aircrafts, we don't have the capacity to go way out there and 
respond and try to help some poor, poor guy like the guy that was saved by the grace of God at the deep water horizon. And it's cold. I just don't understand as decision makers that you would allow such irresponsible development to occur. And I'm, I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Um, I had a lot more things. I had the self-monitoring thing that I don't like that's done by EPA that makes the oil companies do, do their self-monitoring. The leg legacy wells in the NPRA that are still not plugged according to 1990 standards. The, the reports that never we never received that may be over the emission limits, we don't know. The poor modeling technique that was used to measure emissions that are being polluted by individual one, one individual oil company and no cumulative impact assessment done as to how much pollution they're really emitting. And the chemical dispersants that were used in the Gulf of Mexico, they will be just in our ocean forever because it's a cold water scenario system. It's not warm water. And we had to fight to get those chemical dispersants listed because they were saying, oh, it's top secret, it's uh, copyright. Uh, we don't share our information. So I just ran out of time. I'm sorry. Goodbye. Yeah. There is a bill actually uh, that was introduced in the House and actually is a part of the appropriations pro process. It's HR 2021. Rosemary talked about it specifically, the uh, Jobs and Energy Permitting Act. We're very concerned about that bill. It would severely limit EPA's uh, ability to regulate a lot of these pollutants that they've been talking about, um, and it's already a very difficult process. So um, we urge you to contact us um, if you want more information about that bill. And we Definitely don't want to see it in any final version of uh, an interior appropriations bill or any bill that's moving for that matter. Um, so at that, uh, I just want to open it up to see if anybody has any specific questions for any of our panel members. If you haven't signed in, please do so on your way up. And we can also provide more info on um, email. If that is something you want. It's a very, very, very complicated issue. I was wondering about the coastal management. I know California does help a lot of Right. Big deal. It's uh, the Coastal Zone Management Act, as you know, creates these incentives for the states. And Alaska, as a state matter, um, has been concerned that local regions like these folks that have worked to develop those plans to say, in my area, we think development should occur according to these standards or in these areas, that took authority away from Juno and the governor's office. And so for some time, starting with Frank Murkowski, they started to water it down and to take that authority slowly away. And in the Governor Parnell administration, they just let it die. So it is gone. It is, and that, that completely takes away the ability of local communities and the state of Alaska to veto an offshore federal project. It's a totally uh, amazing thing for a state that says states' rights to then take away this program. And it's because they're the, you know, the, the oil industry is so embedded in the state of Alaska, they do not want the local communities to be able to control their access. It's shocking. I mean, it's, I've been uh, working with all these guys have for a long time. It's just, it's shocking. It's a lot of money, too, the communities that don't otherwise have. Hundreds of thousands of dollars to the communities. I don't know, Caroline, if you know how much it might bring in a point hope that wouldn't come in anymore, the coastal management funds from the federal government. On that 193 area, you had talked about the four stages of leasing, and I, I'm pretty sure that's multiple leases up there. Are they all in the same one of those four stages, or are they in different stages? They were all related to sale 193, so that mm -hmm. was the stage two process. And Shell has uh, applied for an exploration plan approval for uh, about this area. And then in 2000, that's for 2012. In 2013, ConocoPhillips uh, is going to seek their exploration plan, and Statoil, the third company that I mentioned, just 
announced today that it's going to seek exploration at, uh, approval for 2014. So that's, it's about 2.3 million acres of leased offshore land out of a 25 million acre lease sale and a 40 million acre planning area. Thank you very much for coming. We